Hey everybody, welcome back to Reason and Theology on a Wednesday, joined by Dr. Jim Papandrea, who is Professor of Church History and Historical Theology at Garrick Evangelical Theological Seminary. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jim, how are you? Thank you, it's uh, it's great to be here. Looking yeah. forward. Yeah, it's an exciting topic. We're talking about icons. Are they idolatrous? Of course, we're referring to the veneration of them. Um, and are they an accretion? Because obviously we have some people, especially Protestants, who are making that claim. And so you're here with us to discuss that. But before we dive into it, let me ask you just a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit more about your background. Yeah, so um, I am a kind of a revert to Catholicism by the roundabout way. So baptized Catholic, raised in a Protestant denomination, ordained in a different Protestant denomination, and wow. then I came back to the Catholic Church through my study of the early church and the church fathers. So it's not an unusual story in that sense. You can, I'm sure you can name several people off the top of your head sure. uh, who had a similar experience. Um, but, uh, but I'm in a situation now where I'm Catholic and I teach Protestants and, um, it's, uh, it's an adventure. Yeah. How is that? Is it a little awkward or is it pretty, uh, easy going? <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing. I mean, when I'm teaching church history, uh, I say up front, you know, first day of the class, this class is not about what you believe. And it's also not about what I believe. This is where you learn what your ancestors in the faith believed those who came before you, that great cloud of witnesses. And so I just tell it like it is or like it was. I mean, I teach the early and medieval church and um, no one can really argue with me because I'm I'm just telling it like it was. Yeah, fair enough. That's, that's a safe way to do it. So I appreciate that approach. Let's dive into the question. I mean, first of all, just for those who may not be familiar, what, what exactly are icons and what is icon veneration, stuff like that? Yeah, I think we need to sort of clarify um, images versus icons and idols. I mean, there, there are really two kinds of images, right? There are icons and there are idols. And uh, the difference between an icon and an idol is not actually in the thing itself, but it's in how it's used um, or how it's approached. And so the proof of this, of course, is is the bronze serpent, right? I mean, I'm sure this comes up in every discussion about icons. Um, you know, you've got this commandment against the worship of images, and it is a commandment against worshiping images, not simply against making images, right? It's a com commandment against worshiping images. And we know that because just a few chapters later, God tells Moses to make images, right? Sure. So right. we have this bronze serpent. The interesting thing about this that sometimes people forget is, the bronze serpent starts out as an icon, but becomes an idol because later on they start worshiping it and it has to be destroyed. And so, you know, the, the, the thing to notice here is that the difference between an icon and an idol is not how it's made, what it looks like, what, you know, what it's an image of or anything like that. It's, it's all about how you approach it, how you use it. Do you worship it? That would be idolatry or not. And mm -hmm. um, I, I love what the Book of Wisdom says about this bronze serpent. It says, um, as a warning for a short time, they were terrorized by the snakes, though they had a sign of salvation. For the one who turned toward it was saved, not by what was seen, but by you, God, the Savior of all. So in other mm -hmm. words, there, even in the Old Testament, it's, it's clearly explained that you know the the power is not in the thing it's in what the thing represents and what we worship is not the thing but what we what we know through the thing or whatever so the point being that uh as long as it's an icon as long as it's not worshiped um it it, it actually can be a sign of salvation and tertullian um brings this out in his document prescription against the heretics uh, he, where he talks about the bronze serpent as a type of the cross. And mm. he said, the cross is a sign of salvation, not that you're saved by the sign itself, but by what it represents, right? And so, um, and in fact, I, I should mention too, Tertullian also is one of our church fathers who gives us a really clear under uh, indication that, 
that the church fathers understood the difference between an icon and an idol. Um, and curiously, I've actually seen this passage brought up as a proof against idols, as though Tertullian was against, uh, sorry, proof against icons, as though as though this is a passage against icons. But right. uh, this is against Marcion, uh, book two. And um, and again, Tertullian points to the, the, the bronze serpent and the seraphim, the little statues on top of the ark. And, uh, and, and he, he points out these are not idols, right? Because they were not being worshipped. And he clearly says that it's what's going on in your heart that matters. If you worship something, it's an idol. If, you know, if you don't worship it, it's okay to have holy things. They can point us to God. Uh, as long as we don't worship them. And so so the church fathers really understood the difference between an icon and an idol. Um, and I mean, a good example of this is like, they also understood the difference between a pagan idol and like just a regular memorial statue, for example. You, you don't really see in the church fathers them uh, sort of criticizing, let's say, equestrian statues of victorious generals because they knew nobody was worshiping it, so they weren't worried about it. So, mm. you know, they don't criticize um, statue, all statues. They criticize idols. But what ends up happening is, I think, and I've seen this uh, among, especially among Protestants, they try to draw out all of these passages from the church fathers that come from the apologists, where they're criticizing pagans who worship idols, and they try to say, aha, here's the church fathers against icons, right? But all of those passages are taken completely out of context because, you know, they are aimed at non-Christians worshiping idols. They are not aimed at Christians with icons. And so they're completely taken out of context. It's like apples and oranges. And so, you know, the church fathers are against apples and people are pulling these passages up out of context and saying they're against oranges. And, you know, you get the idea. Mm. So, uh, you know, that's that's pretty much kind of the difference between, I think, icons and idols. And I do want to get into some of the details of uh, a few individuals, specifically Tertullian and Epiphanius, among others, as well as the Nicene Fathers at uh, Nicaea too. But um, let, let me ask you this, because there's a lot of people who are going to suggest that icon veneration was a very late development and, in fact, an accretion. What would you say in response to that? Well, you know, I think, uh, and I, I made a short video on this that, that circulated for a while, I, just using the word accretion sort of betrays a bias right there. Because technically, the definition of the word accretion doesn't necessarily mean it's anything negative. But of course, it's being used as though um, the very idea of development is a bad thing. And, uh, and so I, I would want to take issue with that from the beginning. Um, there is some development going on here which, uh, you know, we can talk about. Um, but, but up front, I want to say this, right? Because a lot of times what you hear from Protestants who are against the, the, the veneration of icons is they will try to first prove that the church fathers were against icons. Mm -hmm. And then they will say that the development is a reversal from that. That is absolutely not true, right? So there's, there's really almost no patristic, um, documents against the veneration of icons. And we can talk about a couple of exceptions. Um, and, uh, and, and, and yet, right, there is a bit of development in, you know, how these icons are used. So, you know, we can see very early on, um, you know, the, the, the fact that the early Christians had Christian art, they had paintings, they had symbols, they had signs, um, anyone who thinks that, you know, the early Christians didn't have icons has not been in the catacombs in Rome. So, uh, because when you go in the catacombs, you see the vignettes of Bible stories, you see the symbols painted, um, you see even some symbols that Christians and pagans held in common as symbolic of things like eternal life, like palm branches and things like that. Um, the anchor, the cross. Uh, sometimes you'll hear the myth that the cross did not come into use as a symbol until after Constantine. That's not true. It was in use before Constantine. Um, it starts out as like an anchor with a cross sort of built into it. And then a cross 
uh, or an X in a circle, and then it grows from there as a symbol. Um, and of course, we know Christians were making the sign of the cross on their bodies very early on. But the other thing that you have to understand when you talk about icons is you can't really talk about icons without also talking about relics, right? Because from the beginning of the church, Christians have venerated relics. We can see this in some of the earliest documents. The martyrdom of Polycarp talks very specifically about um, his bones being being honored and put in a special place. Um, and, uh, and by the way, read Acts 19, 11 and 12, mm. the passage that people are uncomfortable with, but it's there. <laughs> Acts 19, right? What happens? They touch aprons and veils to Paul, and these holy things have healing power. And so, um, you know, you've got, you've, you've got a lot of miracle stories, right? And, and it's not that we have to believe every miracle story from the early church, mm -hmm. but the fact that there are miracle stories about relics proves that no one has a problem with relics, right? So, so, uh, so relics are venerated from the very beginning. Um, they are treated as holy. The presence of a relic in a place makes that place a holy place. And eventually, uh, when they start building church buildings, you have to have a relic in the altar for that church to be consecrated. So that becomes, you know, the rule. And so or the, the presence of a relic makes a church holy ground. And then, um, and then you start seeing statues and, and portraits by the fourth century. By the way, most people know that, uh, you know, you don't really get church buildings built to be church buildings until the fourth century when Constantine legalizes Christianity. But what a lot of people don't realize is before he ever built those church buildings, he commissioned the baptistry in Rome. And what was in the baptistry in Rome at that time? A 30 pound golden statue of a lamb representing Jesus, right? Nobody had a problem with this, right? Um, now, you know, later there's going to be a council uh, called the Council in Trullo, where they are going to worry a little bit about whether people might start worshiping lambs, but, uh, yeah. but kind of a temporary concern. Um, but anyway, you see, we, you know, if you go to Rome and look at the fourth and fifth century mosaics in the churches and, you know, look at the imagery and look at the icons. Now, here's where we get into the, the subject of development, because when it comes to icons, right? At first, when they're in the catacombs and, and things, at first they're used more for what I would call remembrance, right? To remind people of the Bible stories they know, to give them encouragement, to remind people of the hope of eternal life, and to give them hope, right? So um, so at the beginning, these, uh, I, I would say they're not they're not for education. Like you can't learn a Bible story from a little vignette about Daniel in the lion's den. But when you see a painting of Daniel in the lion's den, you remember the Bible story and you apply it to your present situation in a time of persecution, right? So remembrance. And there is a development, I think, uh, from remembrance to reverence, right? When it comes to icons. But that development is entirely based on the early reverence uh, toward relics. So the mm -hmm. early reverence toward relics is then extended to the icons and uh, it develops. It's not a late development and it's certainly not a reversal, but it is a bit of a development. Yeah, that's a really good point that you bring up about the relics because it's really just a hop, skip and a jump away from venerating icons. You know, one of the things that stands out to me in the martyrdom of Polycarp, which you referenced earlier, a very early attestation to the veneration of relics is um, they're very careful to distinguish between venerating relics versus idolatry. They're mm -hmm. very, very explicitly careful to say this is not <laughs> idolatry. And so um, you can see how they're, they are operating with some of those distinctions with relics. So it would be That's pretty right. easy to then map that onto right. icons. But, but you are saying that at first with, with the catacombs images, it's not necessarily that they were venerating those images in the way we would today, but they were more perhaps didactic in purpose. And then they mapped on the veneration of relics to those images later on. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. 
I think that's fair. Although I, I wouldn't use the word didactic. I would use the word maybe something like edifying, right? Um, okay. Again, so no one's going down in the catacombs to, to learn from the pictures. Uh, they're not educational in that way. But mm -hmm. um, it, it's sort of assumed that you already know the, the Bible story or the reference, you know. But yeah. you're right. There is, there is a bit of that, um, that development. But, you know, another important point is this. And, and you, to your point, you, may, you, you pointed out that even as early as the martyrdom of a Polycarp, they know the difference between veneration and worship. Mm -hmm. So when we look at like uh, Nicaea II in the eighth century and we say, oh, here's where they clarify the Greek words for the difference between veneration and worship. Mm -hmm. It's not as though that distinction was new at that time. The distinction right. is ancient. It, it's just that it was at that time that they were forced to clarify the technical terminology around it because of the controversy. Yeah, I think m the martyrdom of Polycarp, I'm searching my memory here, I think they use the term adore, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, um, you but, know, they, I, but they don't I, exactly use the language that's later there at Nicaea, but you're sure. right, the concept is there, even if they're not yeah. necessarily using that that's language. Right. That's right, and always keep in mind, adore is an English word, right? So you'd have to go back to the Greek text and look at the Greek word sure. that they're using Sure. Right, you know for sure, and this is another problem I see with a lot of these debates: is people are going back and forth over the English translations of these documents, and often hundred-year-old archaic English translations. Right. And they base their whole argument on English translations without knowing the original language. So. Yeah, that's a really good point. Now, what would you do with some of the? and iconic uh, that are seemingly so in the um, early church, perhaps the Council of Elvira. This is brought up a lot in Canon 36, yeah. which for those who are not familiar, I'll just briefly read. It says, pictures are not to be placed in churches so that they do not become objects of worship and adoration. If they're saying, look, you can't have these pictures in the churches, does that not undercut the notion um, that they were venerating icons? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. So first of all, uh, the Council of Elvira uh, took place in Spain in about 305, 306. And we do not have uh, the original uh, documentation from that council. Mm -hmm. And a lot of scholars believe that the canons of Elvira have later editions included in them. And I would argue that this is one of those later editions, and the, the evidence I would use for that is, um, is, is internal. It's in the canon itself. In other words, um, in the churches, mm -hmm. okay? Where are these churches? Where are these multiple buildings identified as churches in the year 305 or 306? There aren't any, right? I mean, you do have a few buildings in the whole empire that we know of that were sort of buildings converted that were known to be churches, that were known to be places of Christian worship. You've got the Dura Europa's house, but we don't actually have church buildings yet in 305, 306. And I don't know of any in Spain uh, that you could point to and say that is a church, mm. right? Mm. So I think that this canon is a later addition to uh, the canons of Elvira. And, um, and even if it's not, Elvira is a local synod. Uh, its canons would not be binding anywhere outside of its area. Um, and so it would be, so, so I would argue um, that's a later edition. And I would also argue regardless that it is an outlier, it, an outlier. It's a, it's an exception, you know, to the, sure. to the census, right? And it, this brings up an important point, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I have a video on this uh, on my channel that I made uh, somewhat in indirect response to some of these debates, but just that, you know, you can't proof text the church fathers, right? The church fathers are not the Bible, right? If the Bible, if, if you're reading the Bible and the Bible has only one verse that says riding a bicycle is a sin, you know, thou shalt not ride upon the two-wheeled abomination, Right. That's all you need. You only need that one verse and don't ride a bicycle. The church fathers are not like that, right? You can't, you know, proof text the church fathers and say, well, okay, well, here's one church father or one local synod that says X, therefore 
that represents the whole church. It doesn't work that way um, because our tradition is based on the consensus of the church fathers. And, um, and, and so even if this canon of Elvira is authentic, it does not speak for the consensus. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Now, others are going to point especially to Epiphanius. He's a pretty favorite one that I, I've noticed people like to appeal to. And, of course, there's that story where he sees a church that has an image of Jesus in it, and he just you know flips out. So, the um, Anablatha his, incident. <laughs> what, I'm sorry, say that again? The Anablatha incident. That's that the name of the church. Yeah, I gotcha, that. gotcha. Yeah, so. <laughs> I've never yeah. heard it referred to it as that, but I've heard the story many, many times. And That's what right. people are going to say is that, well, here's another attestation to the fact that early Christians were not venerating icons because yeah. it was just against images. Right, right. So, okay, so here's here's what I would say about that. Um, so, again, in context, right, this is a, a letter that Epiphanius is writing because he's in trouble and he's trying to get himself out of trouble. This letter is meant to get himself out of trouble, and he's going through all the things that people have a beef with him about, and he's trying to make excuses, mm -hmm. right? Now, he the, in the very last paragraph, he gets to this story about uh, destroying an image. Now, there are several church fathers who claimed, even closer to that time, that the story wasn't true. Um, now, to be fair, these are church fathers who are in favor of icons, so they don't want the story to be true, right? So they're they're trying to discredit it. But their evidence to say that the story isn't true um, is that Epiphanius's own disciples were not against icons, right? Mm -hmm. um, so so there's that. But let's say for the sake of argument that the story is true. If it's true, it would have happened in the late fourth century, almost the turn of the fifth century, right? And um, so here's the thing to notice. He, he, you know, people quote this and they don't even notice the very first line in the quotation. He says, um, certain persons have this grievous against me. Mm. So right at the beginning of the story, he tells you this. I am one person opposed to this image and multiple people are criticizing me for it. Right. Mm -hmm. So again, if it's true, right, he's in the minority. If it's true, he is, in fact, the exception that proves the rule because, you know, everybody's opposed to him. Uh, everybody's everybody's criticizing him for having this opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, um, yeah, so I think that's probably all I would need to say about that. You know, uh, there are going to be outliers, you know. Sure. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, even even with, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity, there are outliers and, uh, and some will go so far as to become heretics. I don't know if I would say Epiphanius is a heretic, but he gets a lot of criticism. Most of what he writes, uh, you know, in his doctrinal stuff is just cobbled together, plagiarized from other people. So, yeah, you know. Now, what would you say about Tertullian? You brought him up earlier. Would you say he's also one of these outliers? Uh, no, actually, Tertullian is is not an outlier. Now, let's do, we can talk about though. There is one passage that uh, people like to pull out um, where they try to claim that Tertullian is um, criticizing images. It's from his document called On Modesty, chapter ten. Right um, now, a couple of things. Tertullian is a rigorist. He is more strict than the mainstream. So if you want to think of the rigorists of the early church, uh, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Hippolytus, Novation, right? Novation actually went so far as to be a schismatic as well. So Tertullian is a rigorist, and he's very strict, and he's trying to argue for only one repentance in your lifetime, right? So you get baptized, you commit a mortal sin, you get one. You repent. If you commit that same mortal sin again, Tertullian saying you should be excommunicated. You should be out. Now, you know, and this is important because of context, right? The early church had a problem with adultery. They did. And one of the reasons why they did was because pagan men entering the church from a Roman context were coming from a lifestyle where they were raised to believe that adultery and visiting prostitutes was their right as a Roman man. Now they get baptized and the church says, you don't get to do that anymore. Okay, they make that commitment, but they fall. And then they fall a second time. Tertullian is saying, if you fall a second time, 
you should not be allowed reconciliation. His opponents are trying to argue for at least two reconciliations, maybe more. And for some reason, his opponents are using a document called The Shepherd by this guy Hermas um, as their proof text for this. Sometimes it's called The Shepherd of Hermas. So, uh, so Tertullian is arguing against those guys, right? Now, Tertullian knows that the shepherd is a heretical document. It's adoptionist. It's angel Christology. And you know that because the shepherd in the document is not Jesus. It's an angel. So here are people, here are Christians trying to argue for more reconciliation, but they're using as their proof text this fringy document. Some people are saying it should be in the canon. Tertullian is arguing that it should not. And so here's what he says when he gets to this passage. He says, you guys have images of, the sh of a shepherd on your chalice for communion, but you're looking for your inspiration to the wrong shepherd. You're reading this other document about a shepherd who isn't Jesus, right? And he's calling them hypocrites for saying, you have Jesus on your chalice. Then why do you, why do you uh, try to use as a proof text this document, the shepherd, that is a different shepherd. So, so, so Tertullian is calling these guys hypocrites for having Jesus on their chalice as the shepherd, but pointing to this other shepherd. And he says, he says, I don't want to hear about that shepherd in the document called the shepherd. I want to know about the shepherd that John tells us about in his gospel, the good shepherd, right? So here's, here's the reality. When you read that in context, this is not at all about icons. Tertullian is simply acknowledging that, yeah, we have images of the good shepherd on our chalices, but you guys are hypocrites because you're trying to quote a different shepherd, the wrong shepherd. So this is an argument about reconciliation. It's an argument about the canon because Tertullian does not want this document in the canon. And, um, but in context, it's not a prohibition or even a criticism of the image on the chalice itself. Right. So if anyone doesn't believe me on that, go read it again, taking into account what I just told you, read the whole document. You'll see that, you know, that's what it's about. Now, let me ask you one more instance and then we'll we'll move on. Um, Nicaea, too, it, it, it really can be read, at least in a way that seems to suggest that um, the apostles or I should say icon veneration is apostolic. Does that mean that Nicaea II was suggesting that, you know, Paul and Peter were venerating icons or were they just saying that this is apostolic in content? What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, um, here's how I think you should read that. Um, not that, it, not that the, the uh, bishops at Nicaea II were claiming that the apostles made images or, or venerated icons. I don't think they're claiming that. Uh, but again, don't forget Acts 19. Anyway, the healing power of relics in that sense. Uh, I, I should say there is a legend that St. Luke was mm -hmm. a painter. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, there are several medieval paintings that have these legends around them that they claim to be paintings by Luke. They're, they're not. They're medieval paintings. But there is at least this tradition that uh, St. Luke was a painter for what that's worth. But that's not really the point of what Nicaea II is saying. The point of what Nicaea II is saying is that the veneration of icons is consistent with apostolic faith in the sense that it is consistent with apostolic succession and tradition, and it is not opposed to apostolic faith in any way. Um, and, and that the icons themselves uh, promote, which is to say teach and share the same gospel that the apostles preached, right? So it's consistent. This is not some other gospel or some other tradition or a deviation from apostolic tradition. It's all completely consistent with apostolic tradition. So uh, that's how I would respond to that. Now, which one would you say comes first, iconoclasm or iconodulism, the destroying of images or the venerating of images? Oh, by far, the veneration of images comes first. Um, as I said, you know, we've got a bit of a development from what I would call remembrance to reverence, all that based on the veneration of relics, which 
relics in themselves are a kind of an icon, you could argue. Um, and uh, the, the veneration of icons was well established long before it became a controversy. You see, it, it's kind of typical of some of the controversies of the early church. It only became a controversy because somebody opposed it. Before this time, it wasn't a controversy because no one opposed it. And, and what you have to understand about the icon controversy is that the, uh, the, the, the imperial edict, the emperor issuing a law against icons was entirely a political move, 100%. This was not a theological debate um, with like, you know, two sides with bishops on both sides or anything like that. The, the iconoclast side was entirely driven by the emperors and those who supported them. It was 100% an attempt to gain control of the monasteries in the East. What you have to remember is by this time in the West, the monasteries were, were under the control of the Pope. And in the West, the Pope off and on actually had more power than kings and emperors. So in the Western mind, the, the hierarchy of society had the Pope at the top and then king, emperors, kings, lords, right? In the East, it's the opposite. In the East, the, uh, the emperor is at the top of the hierarchy. But the problem was that the monasteries in the East were not under the emperor's control, and he didn't like it. And the monasteries were drawing lots of pilgrims, people coming to look at their beautiful icons, people making donations, monasteries not paying taxes. The emperor wanted the land and the money. And that's what this was all about, 100%. Um, in fact, some of the monasteries in the East actually got turned into the barracks for, uh, they, they were confiscated, turned into barracks for the, for the king's soldiers. Um, so the point is that this would never have been a controversy if not for political reasons. And, um, and, and the reverence of, of icons was already a longstanding tradition. It's the iconoclast position that was new. It's the iconoclast position that was you know, the, the late development. And the proof of this is that when the Eastern emperor um, issues this, this law against icons, people freaked out. There was rioting in Southern Italy where you have Greeks living, you know, Eastern Greeks living under the authority of the Western Pope. They don't know who to listen to, right? And so everybody freaked out. It became a big deal um, because it hadn't been a problem before. Now, when I look at Nicaea too, uh, there's a lot of quotes from the church fathers that they're appealing to. And what some are going to point out is some of these seem spurious. They, they, they seem like forgeries. Can you maybe comment on that? Well, um, my, my response to that is going to be the same as my response to a lot of questions like that. So mm -hmm. when someone says, well, people object to this or people say this is a forgery you know what i want to know is okay so what evidence on what evidence are they basing this um now to be fair you know nicaea 2 wouldn't be the first council that had accretions in its canons right i mean because we talked about that with elvira um but in the case of nicaea 2 i don't personally know of any evidence that would point me in that direction um, and I would also sort of issue a caveat here, which is that, there, you know, there's a trick, that, a very, very popular trick that people use, which is if you find something in an ancient document that you don't like, all you have to do is claim that it wasn't there originally, that it was added later. And, you know, the Jesus seminar turned this whole thing into an art form, right? I mean, you don't like something in the Bible? Say the early church added it later. Well, okay, but that's, you know, you, you can't do that without evidence. Show me the evidence. So. Um, I personally don't know of any reason to doubt, uh, you know, some of these quotations in Nicaea too, but I guess, you know, if I were to look at them in context, I'd have to take them on a case by case basis. Sure. That's fair. Now, um, let me ask this final question and y'all go ahead and put in the questions to, um, at reason and theology in the chat and, uh, we'll do our best to get to them. So do you think there are inconsistencies with Protestants who speak about um, icon veneration as an accretion. Can you think of maybe some instances where there might be some accretions with Protestants, in fact? 
Yeah, well, let me preface this by saying, you know, I try to be very ecumenical. Um, I love my Protestant brothers and sisters, and we are all in the same body of Christ. That's my conviction. Having said that, everything about Protestantism is an accretion. Everything about Protestantism is a late development, right? I mean, so the very doctrines that the Protestant Reformation was built on, sola scriptura, sola fide, these are all things that no one in the early and medieval church ever believed. The idea that you can uh, have that, that that you can't baptize infants, right? These are all late developments. But of course, even Protestants have later developments that they accept. Um, like, for example, the veneration of icons was around a lot earlier than the singing of harmony in hymns, polyphonic music, right? Um, and so, you know, if you're, if you're going to say all accretions are bad, if you're going to say all development is bad, well, then you have to get rid of church buildings, printed Bibles, um, you know, let alone electric guitars and microphones. I mean, so, so I think part of the problem here, right, is that there is within Protestantism a kind of aversion to development in general, mm -hmm. right? And, and I, you know, I will, I will say this. When I was a Protestant, and as I was coming up in a Protestant denomination, I was told in catechism classes that the Protestant Reformation was all about getting back to original Christianity, some kind of, some sort of pristine version of Christianity before the Catholics added all of their extras and their superstitions. That's what I was told. When I actually got a PhD in early Christianity, I realized that's a myth. It's not true, right? There is no such thing as pre-Catholic Christianity. It doesn't exist, right? And so this is why I started uh, my YouTube series, The Original Church, um, to talk about how the original church is the ancient church. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of my thing. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think that there's a problem here in that there is, there is kind of a rejection of development out of hand. And, I, and if, if people don't understand that doctrine and practice develop over the course of the early church, then they don't understand the early church. And, um, and so, you know, we can see that and we can talk about it. And I write about it in my books. Um, we, we have to understand that some developments are very positive and there is a difference between a legitimate development and a, a corruption or a, uh, I mean, again, the word accretion is actually not positive or negative. It's just kind of neutral, mm. but, um, but that's, you know, th that's my conviction. So, um, you know, I think that, that there's, I think there's an element within the Protestant Reformation that, you know, if, if they were going to get people to leave the Catholic Church and come into their reform movements, right, they were going to have to get them to do that on a basis other than sacramentalism and spirituality. It was going to have to be sort of a logical decision. They were going to have to convince people through logic, right, to make that move. And so that sort of turned conversion and even sanctification, conversion, salvation, turned these concepts into an event that happens because you made a decision. But again, in the early and medieval church, nobody believed that, right? It, it wasn't, it's a process that, that you grow in. Um, but in turning conversion and salvation into a, a sort of decision event, it becomes all in the head. And, um, and so it becomes a very intellectual process and it becomes kind of Gnostic which is to say that it becomes kind of disembodied. It's all, it's all mental. And the, you know, the problem with this is it leads to a trend within Protestantism to reject an embodied faith, right? And to make the faith, faith kind of disembodied as though it's intellectual only. But the veneration of relics and icons is really only the affirmation of the incarnation, which proves that God does grant grace through the material, through the physical, that God, that, 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 that holy things 
can actually be a means of grace and that God does not want us to have a disembodied faith. So I realize I'm crossing the line into sermon, so I'll stop there. But uh... <laughs> here's a question for you from icons in the Shroud of Turin. Any thoughts there? Um, yeah, so I think if there is, the shroud would be a very special kind of icon because it is not a man-made icon. Now, I personally happen to believe that it is the real deal. I understand there's debate over that, and that's a great conversation to have. Um, but I personally do believe that the Shroud of Turin is a miraculous image. So, um, so that would be a special kind of icon, I guess. Yeah, so another question here is from Susan. Uh, does an anathema against iconoclasm mean you have to venerate icons or be excommunicated? Ah, yeah. So that's a great question because, you know, the, uh, the, the Nicaea 2 includes these anathemas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and one of them says, uh, I have it here, anathema to those who presume to apply to the venerable images the things said in the Holy Scriptures about idols. So the first, the first thing that's anathematized here is those who confuse images, or, or sort of, sorry, uh, icons for idols. Mm -hmm. And those who apply the prohibition against idols, apply that to icons, you're a heretic. Okay, so there's that. The other one, and I had in front of me somewhere here, but uh, it's, it, it's, it is something to the effect that, you know, for those, in, again, antique English translation, for those who refuse to salute the images or the icons, right? I really think what that means is, it, 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 what, is what it is anathematizing there is um, the refusal to respect the veneration of icons, the refusal to respect the way other people venerate icons. It, I don't think it means you all have to venerate icons because at the end of the day, you know, this, this, this development from remembrance to reverence, it's a spectrum. It's not a, it's not an on off switch. Right. And so it really, it's different for everybody. I mean, the, it, it, it depends what's in your heart. Um, the level to which you are called or feel comfortable venerating icons right? There is obviously a point at which you can cross a line and go too far. It can be done. You can go too far and start worshiping icons. Don't do that. But within the boundary of what's acceptable, we all may have different ways of doing that. So I don't think that Nicaea 2 is saying, y'all have to do it this way, the same way, or you're a heretic. No, I, I think what it's anathematizing is the iconoclasts, those who refuse to recognize icons and therefore want to prohibit them or even destroy them now there's one more question here for you from omar if jesus is the image of god i do not understand why icons and paintings of god the father are made the father is never seen for example uh got a reference here to john 1 18 any thoughts on this yeah um that's that's a really great point um so in the earliest like let's say church mosaics and stuff like that um, where you get any kind of depiction of the Trinity, and you don't get it a lot, but you get obviously Jesus depicted as Jesus. Uh, God the Father is depicted as a, as a hand, the right hand of power, sort of coming down from above, only the hand, and uh, perhaps with a, with a victory wreath, holding the victory wreath over Jesus' head. Holy Spirit maybe comes up as a dove. And I think uh, there, there are some times when you get God the Father depicted as an old white man with a white beard. And I, I kind of feel a little uncomfortable with that, um, not only because God the Father, you know, can't be seen, as you say, but also because if you depict the Father as a human, it sort of takes away from the uniqueness of the second person of the Trinity, who is the only one of the three who became human. So... Um, so, you know, I mean, there are some things we should be careful. We should not just be going about uh, willy-nilly. Is that a, I don't know. That, willy -nilly. that is, uh, yeah, that is a yeah. thing. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, you know, that is, it, it's, it's not license for everyone who calls him or herself an artist to paint or sculpt whatever they want, right? I mean, there are some boundaries to reverence. And I think your point is well taken. I would avoid 
human depictions of the first person of the Trinity. Yeah. Now, do you have a plug that you could put put in for any books that you're working on or have put out or a website, YouTube channel, anything like that? Yeah, for sure. First, let me say this. Um, we're actually going to continue this discussion or follow up on it uh, with Dustin uh, Quick on his video podcast, Holy Smokes. So that's Friday night. I think it's 8 p.m. Eastern time. So if people want more of me, um, that's uh, this Friday night on uh, Holy Smokes. So we're doing that. Also, I would invite people to check out my YouTube channel, The Original Church, and my Locals community, The Original Church Community on Locals. That's the that's a subscription platform, and that's where I do more of the direct interaction with people. I'm teaching a Bible study there um, based on my latest book, which is Reading Scripture Like the Early Church. So mm -hmm. uh, in that book, I talk about how the church fathers read Scripture go uh, and go over the methodology, and I'm using that methodology to actually teach a Bible study uh, over there on Locals. So check out my YouTube, and you can find me there. I'm not on social media. Um, I don't do that. Uh, unless you consider YouTube social media, but I'm, I'm there and I'm on locals. That's about it. Perfect. I'll put a link to the locals account if, uh, if you would like. And so y'all check that out here in just a little bit. I'll add thank it to the show notes. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Jim, for coming on. It was an honor to have you. My pleasure. This was fun. I hope we can do it again. Absolutely. Everybody hit that like button and the subscribe button. Of course, as I always say, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason to theology if you want to support me. We'll see you later. God bless. Right. Oh, wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.